<laughs> Hello, everybody. What does it take to quiet a room of 150 women? Awesome. Good evening, everybody. My name is Sonia Lovell, and I am your host for this evening. Some of you may know me as the host of Dear Menopause, the podcast. I am local to the Northern Beaches. I am also a fierce and at times impatient women's health advocate. It is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to Menopause on the Beaches. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on today. I pay my respect to elders past and present, and I also acknowledge and pay my respects to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. I would like to thank you all for being here today, and I would also like to thank our sponsors, because without them, none of us would be here today. The Isaac family from the Boathouse Group, Adrian Venturi from McGrath Real Estate, Sally Tabner from Bucchino, <laughs> Doctors Kerry and Rick from the Avalon Family Medical Practice, yes, you, yeah, yes, please, <laughs> and Dr. Kelly Teagle, who you will meet very soon from Wellfem. If you've started noticing some small changes, little things like your fanny hairs have started growing on your chin. <laughs> or maybe your bed is the only place that you remember everything you were supposed to do that day. Or an increasing desire to tell everybody to get lost. <laughs> then you are in the right room. Tonight, you are going to learn from leading experts in the holistic care of women in their menopausal transition, Dr. Louise Newson and Dr. Kelly Teagle. You will, excuse me, you will also hear from local menopause advocate, Julie Dutton, as she very generously shares her own lived experience with us. It's important at this point that I do mention that the information provided during this event is for general information purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your own doctor with any questions you may have regarding your own health. The organisers, speakers and presenters are not responsible for any health-related decisions made by attendees based on information presented during this evening's event. I would, also, <coughs> excuse me. I would also like to acknowledge that people of diverse gender expressions and identities experience menopause. And although we may use the terms woman, female and her this evening, we recognise that everyone's menopause transition is unique and deserves to be acknowledged and supported. Now, there is one woman I'd like you all to meet before we go any further. She is the catalyst for tonight's event, perimenopausal herself, a proud GP, <laughs> and co-owner of the Avalon Family Medical Practice. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kerry Cashel. Thank you, Sonia. I am really going to try to speak slowly tonight. <laughs> it's really hard. So, good evening, everyone. For anyone that doesn't know me already, my name is Kerry Cashel and I'm a GP and practice owner of the Avalon Family Medical Practice on the Northern Beaches here in Avalon. And as most of you probably know, I am extremely passionate about women's hormonal health. So the journey for me to tonight started almost two years ago when 
I was seeing one of our um, panel here tonight as a patient, and I hope she doesn't mind me saying that. I haven't checked. Um, <laughs> Jules, and um, she said, listen, you really need to upskill on your HRD. <laughs> So I did, as all good doctors should do, I listened to my patient and I went off and did the course that she told me about, some confidence in the menopause course by some random woman in the UK called Dr. Louise Newson, and, and that was it. Um, so I did the course and then I started listening to her podcasts, uh, running up and down Palm Beach, as Mo Roberts will testify. And it was those patient stories that for me, really hit home and I, I, I almost wanted to run into work and go, ah, you're perimenopausal, oh my God, you're menopausal and I haven't treated you well. So now after that, I literally eat, sleep and breathe hormones as anybody who knows me will testify. So uh, Louise for me really, I think she has kickstarted a revolution into women's health and she's put optimizing women's hormonal health central to improving uh, the health outcomes for all women. And I'm still completely blown away that when I said, do you fancy coming to Sydney and doing your book launch? Uh, and she said yes. So uh, that's amazing. So thank you so much for coming. So cool. As Sonia said, there's been lots of people who've been instrumental, um, half of whom are sitting in the audience. Um, and also, but very particularly, the Isaac family, who I have definitely crossed crossed patient boundaries with by asking if they'd help out with the venue. And um, Adrian, well, he sold my house, so he owed me something. And Sally at Vicuccino, and for Kelly coming all the way from Canberra, um, who runs the fantastic Wellfem Telehealth Hormonal Service, and to Sonia for kindly agreeing to MC and support me through my anxieties over the past month. <laughs> So without further ado, I hope you all have a fantastic night. Um, I think this will be really informative and just let's make it another step to making each and every woman's health great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, now, somebody did point out to me um, prior to starting that given how many menopausal transition women are in the room, it would be a really good idea to point out where the toilets are. <laughs> So, yes, to the left, you will see there is a doorway on the far left. Follow that through. It's very well signposted. That is where the bathrooms are. Um, okay. Our first guest tonight is the founder of the UK-based Newson Health Group, the award-winning Balance Menopause Support app and website, and is the host of the number one medical podcast in the UK. Described as the medic who kick-started the menopause revolution, Dr. Louise Newson is also a number one Sunday Times best-selling author. Her confidence in menopause course for health professionals and anyone with a interest in self-education has been downloaded by over 30,000 clinicians globally. I will add that I am equally impressed by her ability to master yoga headstands. <laughs> Here tonight to discuss her latest book, The Definitive Guide to the Perimenopause and Menopause, it's an absolute honour to welcome to the stage Dr Louise Newson. Thank you. What a privilege being here. It just doesn't quite feel right. Rebecca Lewis, who's standing at the back, who is not going to escape because she's a doctor as well. So when I'm handed a bit later, you can hand her too. Um, when Kerry contacted us about coming over, I was already coming to Melbourne, which we're going to in a couple of days, to talk at a conference about mental health and the menopause. So we just thought, yeah, let's just call him in Sydney on the way. <laughs> Um, but it still feels a bit weird. Neither of us had much sleep last night, so I'm not drunk. I'm just a bit... <laughs> <laughs> um, but I am, as, as many of you might know, I'm very evidence-based in my approach. I really... Um, everything I do, I like to be evidence-based. So I'm going to tell you something now that's going to make you feel a bit weird. Um, and you'll realise why when I say it. So a few years ago, I went to see a clairvoyant. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Um, my mother-in-law is very spiritual, and I am quite spiritual as well, actually. And um, I decided to go and see her with my daughter, who has really bad migraines, just to see if there was anything. Um, anyway, uh, other than her diagnosing my daughter's asthma that I'd misdiagnosed, she also said to me, you're going to do something where you're going to help a lot of women. I was like, really? I'm not that interested in doing smears. I'm not really interested. <laughs> I was like, okay, whatever. And then she said, but you're also going to go to Australia and it's going to be really important that you go there. I was like, really? And then COVID hit and I, it's always been in the back of my mind. So actually being here in Australia is all thanks to a clairvoyant. I saw. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for those of you that don't know me, I'm a doctor, clearly. I'm also a pathologist. I've got a pathology degree, so I'm quite geeky, actually. And I never, as you just heard, wanted to do women's medicine. I um, actually wanted to do cancer medicine. So I've got a background of a lot of hospital medicine, which meant I've gone through all sorts of specialties in my career. I've done hematology, I've done rheumatology, I've done um, neurology, I've done cardiology, I've done gastroenterology... Um, but I never thought about the menopause in any of those specialties because no one taught me. So I've seen lots and lots of women, especially middle-aged women in my career, and put down their symptoms to all sorts of things other than hormones. Um, and then after I got married in 97, um, I met my husband in 88, a long time ago, uh, when we were medical students. And he's a surgeon, and I decided to pivot into general practice because I couldn't really find a career... Um, I couldn't really find a, a sort of female model in medicine that I really aspired to be like. Um, I could see lots that I didn't want to be like. So I decided the easiest way of going part-time and seeing my children would be going into general practice, which was great, because it taught me a very holistic way of practicing medicine, which it, before it was bed number 30, asthma, bed number 29 is whatever. Um, so it made me think very much about the patient, about really what's happening, what they wanted as well, which is really important in medicine because so much in medicine is about treating a disease and looking at the numbers and the results and forgetting, actually, that everybody's individual. So the most important thing I learned from being a GP was that everybody's different. Of course, we all look different. We've got different expectations. We have different symptoms. We might have different side effects to treatment. And we might have different expectations for what that treatment might be. So it taught me a huge amount. Um, and then I had two children very quickly, two under two, which was quite hard work, um, and went part-time. But then I, I added lots of hours to uh, my work by doing a lot of medical writing. So I always joke to say I've worked part-time, but I've never worked part-time in my life. I've always worked all the time, really. Um, but did a lot of writing for um, healthcare professionals to summarise evidence into piecemeal pieces to make it very easy for them to understand, but also um, translate quite difficult text, really, and evidence for people, patients, to understand as well. So I've done that for the last 25 years or so. And as a GP, I'd seen lots of people, lots of women, and when they came to me very floridly menopausal because they'd diagnosed themselves, usually because of the flushes and sweats, because that's all anyone talked about, about the menopause, I would give them HRT and they would come back saying, my goodness, you've transformed my life, thank you so much. And I'm thinking, gosh, that doesn't happen with much else in medicine that I do. Um, so then I've, obviously, the last um, seven, eight years, all I've done is thought about the menopause and the perimenopause. And it's been a really interesting journey, actually, because something that I thought was just a few hot flushes and sweats is so much more. Um, and if we break down the word menopause, it doesn't mean men stop, get away from me, I don't want anything to do with you. It's actually a really weird diagnosis because um, it means a stop of periods. So already it's defining half the population as their periods. I don't want to be defined as my periods, and I'm sure a lot of you don't really want to. And the best thing about being menopausal is not having periods, actually. Um, but you have to be a year without your periods to be officially menopausal. And there's nothing else in medicine. We have to wait a whole year before we can say, no, come back, come back, and then we can give you this word, this, this meaning that just means your periods have stopped. And what actually happens, as many of you might know, is that our ovaries produce eggs, and we have a finite number of eggs. And when they run out, the hormones associated with the eggs' uh, production decline um, and stop, and they become very low. Um, and that, 
doesn't really matter so much when we think about getting older and fertility, because we need eggs for fertility, but it does matter when we think about our hormones. And hormones are just chemical messengers. They're just a messenger that go from one cell to another to tell our body what to do. We've got lots of hormones in our body. You might have heard of what hormones such as adrenaline, our stress hormone, or cortisol, or thyroxine, or insulin, um, serotonin, our happy hormone, dopamine, our reward hormone. They're all different hormones. And we have estrogen and um, progesterone and testosterone, actually, isn't just for the boys. We produce more testosterone than estrogen when we're younger, and it declines as we get older. But these hormones get produced mainly by our ovaries, elsewhere as well. Our, our brains produce estrogen as well as our ovaries. But when our levels go down, we have less in our bloodstream. So we have cells everywhere in our body that respond to these hormones. And they're biologically active, so they set up lots of chemical reactions in our body, which is really good for our health. So when we don't have the hormones, we can have all sorts of symptoms, and we've already heard a few of them, um, but there are many more. And you can go onto some websites and they'll talk about 36 symptoms or 84 or 126. And every day, actually, I learn more and more symptoms from my patients. They'll tell me about their dry eyes, their burning mouth, their joint pains, their muscle aches, their palpitations, their shortness of breath, their irritable bowel syndrome, their restless legs, um, their pins and needles, their dry skin. It, the list goes on and on, and we're all different. So not everyone has the same symptoms, and not everyone, thankfully, has all the symptoms at the same time. Um, some people don't even have symptoms, but a lot of people do. And with the Balance app, um, we've had over a million downloads, so we've got lots of information when people have monitored symptoms. And the commonest symptoms are actually low mood, anxiety, memory problems, fatigue, this brain fog, reduced libido as well. And then flushes and sweats are there, but they're a bit lower down. But before our periods stop, we often have fluctuations of our hormones. They don't just go down very nicely and slowly. They go up and down. And in that time, we call it the perimenopause. And peri is just around the time of the menopause. So for sometimes up to 10 years, people can have these fluctuations in hormones. And periods might be changing. They might just be a little bit lighter. They might be less frequent. Or for many women, actually, the periods can become a lot heavier and closer together. And it'd be very difficult to know because there's no blood test. There's no hormone test to diagnose the perimenopause. So a lot of us, myself included, blame our husbands for breathing too loudly. <laughs> um, or, or just work being too stressful. Um, and it can be very disconcerting. I, I, seven years ago, I realized that a lot of patients I was talking to, I had no idea what they just told me. And I thought, I've said sorry like twice because I couldn't quite realize what they were saying, but I couldn't keep saying that. And then when you can't remember drug names, it's really quite scary. Um, and then I kept looking at the examination couch and thinking, oh, I'd just like a little rest. <laughs> um, um, but no one sort of told me, no one told me what was going on. And I, the most ironic thing was that I was starting to develop the website that was Menopause Doctor. It's now balance-menopause.com. So every night I was trying to stay awake to write this website and kept saying to my husband, God, I feel like I've been drugged. I'm so tired. Like, what's going on? He said, you're so miserable. You're so... <laughs> you're no fun to be with. And I kept waking up in the night, drenched in sweat, and thinking, oh, no, I've got lymphoma, which is a type of blood cancer that causes night sweats. And I used to just creep out of the, of the bedroom and get a towel to lie on, because I thought, if I wake him up by stripping the beds, he'll be really cross. So I'd just lie there in this horrible sweat. So, like, and I'm not a sweaty person. And then in the morning, I'd feel more tired and more irritable, and this cycle went on, get some palpitations, gave up caffeine, gave up alcohol, still carried on. My migraines were getting worse. I'm writing every night about all these symptoms of the perimenopause. I'm lecturing to doctors, <laughs> saying it's not all about flushes. Didn't put it together until my daughter, who was 14 at the time, said, Mummy, you are so irritable. I really think maybe you need a period, because some of my friends are like you just before they have their period. And I just went, ah, oh, right. That's why I'm having all those symptoms. Thanks, Sophie, that I'm actually menopausal. And she went, oh, no, that makes you sound really old. Don't say that. <laughs> um, 
But then the next piece of the jigsaw was actually trying to find treatment. My GP wouldn't prescribe HRT because it's too dangerous. It would give me breast cancer, apparently. I'd already been writing lots of information, unpicking the evidence, realising how safe HRT was. So I had to go and see someone private who had a six-month wait. And I phoned up, and it was in the summertime. And they said, yes, he's got an appointment on the 23rd of December. I said, do you know who I am? I can't wait that long. <laughs> Of course she didn't know who I was. But um, I, was, I have since apologised to her. But um, it <laughs> made, made me realise how horrible it is and how desperately alone you can feel because I had this great ambition that I wanted to set up a menopause service. I wanted to set up a clinic. And one night I arranged to go for a, some education in Birmingham near where I live. And I said to my husband, you've got to be back on time. I'm going to go, da, 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 da. So he came home on time to look after the children. And I was there in my jogging pants and no makeup. And he said, what are you doing? I said, you know what? It's raining. I can't go. And he said, what? <laughs> and I was just trying to find any excuse because I had no self-confidence, no self-worth, just feeling awful, like a lot of perimenopausal women do. But I thought I was just feeling too tired because I was overworking. And actually, you, you become very, very withdrawn from society. Not everyone, but a lot of people do. And you can see, or I could see quite quickly, how people could give up work, how they could lose their relationships. There are times that if my husband had said to me, do you know what, I'm going, I would have gone, good, there's the door, I don't need you. <laughs> but I, I adore him, I need him for lots of things. But it's, um, <laughs> it's really quite hard. And so then I did manage to get onto some HRT. I did manage to get the right dose and type. And I've also managed to take testosterone too. So I'm very lucky. But actually, I realise how hard it is for people globally. I realise how hard it is if you're not a white, middle-class, English-speaking person who's got a bit of oomph to sort of say, no, actually, I really want this. So then I decided to set up a clinic. Um, I couldn't get a job in the NHS. I do have a very good CV, but no one was interested. No one had any money. It was all about heart disease or raised blood pressure or diabetes. So I decided to set up a clinic just privately on my own just to get some of my friends off antidepressants because that's what they were being given for their perimenopause or menopause, um, which isn't a treatment, by the way. Um, so I then set up one day a week, and then people were coming from all over the country. So I went from one to two to three days a week. And meanwhile, Rebecca Lewis is at the back. We were going for walks. And I said, I've just seen this lady who's come from Scotland. And she told me that she's given up her job. She's, her, her, her partner's left her. And all these symptoms started when she had her ovaries taken out, age 35. She's only 45, and she's really suffering. And Rebecca said, oh, that must be just a one-off. I said, no, 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 I've seen so many people who've been um, prescribed antidepressants. They've, been, they've gone to psychiatric hospitals. They've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Or, um, I can't believe what's happening. No one's been talking about HRT. And I said, look, I'm really busy. Can you see some patients? She said, oh, no, I'm not going to do any private medicine. I said, please. So she did. And it is the most transformational medicine that we've ever done because the important thing about anything in medicine is to try and help people feel better, of course. But I think even more important than that is helping prevent disease because although I'm a doctor and I treat disease, I would much prefer to not see people with diseases. So these hormones that we have in our body, they're not just there to um, cause us awful symptoms when we don't have them. They actually, like I say, they're very important in our body. So when we have low estrogen and testosterone and progesterone levels, it increases a, a risk of diseases. So it's very depressing tonight, actually, because menopausal women do have an increased risk of diseases, including heart disease, which is the number one killer worldwide, actually, and dementia. They have an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, increased risk of osteoporosis, which affects one in two women over the age of 50, also an increased risk of clinical depression. So very doom and gloom, but the less doom and gloom part is that replacing those missing hormones actually reduces the risk of these diseases because you're giving back what's missing. We're not designed to be living in our 70s, 80s and 90s without hormones. Um, but we've been told for the last 20, 30 years that HRT is dangerous, it's safe, we shouldn't have it. Or we should only have it if we're really suffering, if we tried everything else first. But actually, we can do all the exercise we like. We can eat all the yam plants or eat all the soy that we can get our hands on, but it's not going to replace our missing hormones. And so there's very few women that absolutely can't take HRT, actually. And even those that decide not to take it systemically, as in the oestrogen through the skin as a patch or gel or the tablets, 
I can still use it vaginally. And um, we've, we've heard a little bit about um, uh, pubic hair, so we can talk about vaginal dryness, which actually vaginal symptoms affect around 80% of women, and they're progressive. They get worse with time. Flushes and sweats might improve. But symptoms related to vaginal... And it's not just dryness. It can be soreness. It can be discomfort. I see a lot of women who don't wear underclothes, who can't sit down, or who have recurrent urinary tract infections, cystitis, um, a bit of incontinence, thinking it's just normal because they're aging those symptoms can be really improved very easily with vaginal hormones so even people that don't take hrt can have vaginal hormones very safely usually um, so there are lots of benefits of taking hrt the big study that came out over 20 years ago the whi women's health initiative study that told the world that hrt caused breast cancer when they analysed that data properly, it actually showed there wasn't a statistically significant increased risk of breast cancer. And actually, women who took oestrogen on its own had a lower risk of developing breast cancer. And the, t the combination, the oestrogen and progestogen that these women had in the study are a type that we don't prescribe now. So the body identical hormones we usually prescribe have never been shown to be associated with a risk of breast cancer. But even the worst studies showing the worst type with the worst type showing the worst increase of breast cancer that increased risk is incredibly small and overall the risk of dying from breast cancer is lower in women who take HRT if you look at the magnitude of risk a woman who drinks a couple of glasses of wine a night a woman who's slightly overweight a woman who doesn't exercise has a far higher risk actually of breast cancer than women who take the worst type of HRT but that's just what I was trying to say at the beginning is that it's about individual choice so I'm not here coming all the way over the other side of the world to say, you all have to take HRT. Of course I'm not. All I'm trying to do is say it's about choice. It's about what you want to do. Whether we take HRT or not, we have to be thinking about our hearts. We have to be thinking about our brains. We have to be thinking about our bones. So although I take HRT, there's no point in me having fried food and whiskey on my frosties every morning or um, <laughs> chips every every evening and sitting on the sofa and not exercising because HRT is good but it's not that good <laughs> um, so but we all make choices in life we decide what we do what we wear what we drive what we do it's the same with our menopause because um, menopause will last forever it's not just a little transition that we'll go through for a few years once our hormones are low, they're low forever. So if we have symptoms or not, we've still got these health risks that we should address. Um, and that's where it's really important to get education. So there's lots of information out there on the websites, on various platforms. There's lots of incorrect information as well. So as, as, as quickly as I write information and books, as, there's as lots of other people doing similar things, but not always evidence-based, um, even though not everything I do is evidence-based, as you heard at the beginning. Um, so just make sure you have what's right for you and feel comfortable. And the other thing to say is that any choice you make can be completely re reversed as well. Um, and that's really important. We spend a lot of time with our patients saying, you, if you decide HRT, you are in control. You can stop it at any time, or you can restart it, or you can change direction. The same with what exercise we do or anything else as well. But um, to have somebody that you can work with, a clinician who really understands, is really, really important. So I've talked a lot. I hope I've set the scene for tonight. I know we've got quite a few questions which uh, we'll, we'll answer. So, but I just want to thank you all again for making me feel so welcome. And Rebecca too. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Louise. Okay, how the rest of the evening is going to run? I'm going to do a comedy show. No, joking. That would be really boring. Um, ladies, would you like to come up and join us? We are going to have a panel discussion. We have pre-set um, questions that we will be putting to all members of our panel this evening. Um, we will be running through those. We then have questions that everybody that has um, bought a ticket was given the opportunity to email through any questions that they wanted to be um, posed to the guests that we have here this evening, we'll be answering those after we've run through the panel discussion. So there'll be two kind of question and answer sessions um, 
that we'll run through now. So we'll start with our panel questions, which will be more of a discussion between the guests here on the panel, and then we'll move into the, answering the questions that were sent through from you guys that are attending tonight. So you've all met Louise. Guys, if you want to grab your microphones and we'll do a quick check that everything is all set up and working and Adam has worked his magic down the back. Um, Louise, this is your microphone here. Beautiful. You have a green light, green for go. Um, you've all met Louise. Jules, why hello. don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? <laughs> Finished talking. Um, hello. Um, I am Julie Dutton. I am a menopause advocate and a perimenopausal woman. Um, I'm kind of the reason why we're sort of here, kind of, as Kerry alluded to earlier. Um, yeah, I just said, when I was perimenopausal, I um, didn't know what was going on and educated myself and just found Louise, thank you, Louise, and said, Kerry, you've got to, you've got to follow this lady, she's amazing, she's doing amazing work, and here we are, so, yeah. Um, I'm also a registered nurse. I was an intensive care nurse for about 20 years. Um, and, yeah, I've got lots of stories about um, the effects of menopause on women. So, but yeah, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. Thank you. And we're very happy to have you. Dr Kelly Teagle. Kelly, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, Sonia. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Teagle. I'm a GP in Canberra. And um, I, uh, I've been working in women's health as a GP for quite a long time, working in sexual health, family planning, menopause clinics, and realised that women were having to travel a very long way in some cases to get services. So I started uh, thinking about the idea of delivering menopause care either by by, oh, there it is, by phone or by telehealth, which was kind of a fledgling thing back then, pre-COVID. And um, so I started seeing some of my patients by telehealth and then um, the idea kind of grew. The idea kind of um, really got legs during COVID, obviously. So now I run the Wellfem Telehealth Menopause Clinic and also uh, doing some other activities, including developing an online women's healthy lifestyle program and delivering a menopause summit over the next couple of weeks as well. So, yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Very excited Louise could come. Very excited to meet her. Amazing. All right, let's kick off with these questions. Kelly, first, we're going to pop the first question through to you. I might just keep on using yours. Yeah, just pass between you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, Kelly, can you explain to us what is considered gold standard hormone therapy for managing both perimenopause and menopause in Australia? Right. So, um, look, there are lots of products out there and um, we've got, in, in Australia, we've got TGA approved medications, the Therapeutic Goods Association, um, you know, kind of looks at the different indications for medications and that's generally the way doctors will prescribe. Um, the, we look at what the evidence shows about what are likely to be the safest and most effective products. Um, what we know from the evidence, particularly around things like the Women's Health Initiative study that Louise was talking about, is that um, it seems to be, um, like for example, breast cancer risk, um, they think that, uh, well, we, we know from the evidence that breast cancer risk is more likely associated with the type of progestin that's used in these products. And um, so we have products available that are TGA approved, that are body identical, that are sort of um, the same molecule that your body would normally produce. That's what the body identical term means versus bio-identical, bio which tends to be compounded uh, things that aren't as standardised. So our, to, to try and bring that tighter, I guess I would say that we're looking at body-identical hormones wherever possible. Micronized progesterone hasn't been shown to increase breast cancer risk like some of the synthetic progestins. And there are body-identical uh, forms of estrogen available these days, unlike, you know, 20 years ago when the Women's Health Initiative study was done. Mm -hmm. Louise, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think we're a bit more fortunate in the UK because we've got a bit more choice 
compared to you, which is good. Um, we've also got, it's really ironic, isn't it, that we've got testosterone that is licensed over here. So we've got this product, Androfem, um, which is a female testosterone cream. And it's the only, you're, you are the only country in the world where women have a <laughs> licensed testosterone nice. cream, yeah. which is madness. As I already said at the beginning, women produce more testosterone than estrogen when they're younger, yet we're not allowed our own hormone back. It's... I, I just can't understand it. And then you've got different vaginal hormonal treatments as well, haven't you? Mm -hmm. um, we've got one called Intrarosa Prasterone, which is DHEA, which converts to estrogen and testosterone, which I think you're getting sort of Yeah, it's a bit been more. A, a, applied for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Can you maybe explain for us the difference between... Um, so, obviously, with estrogen, there's gel applications, there's patches, there's oral, and then we have vaginal um, applications as well. Kelly, would you mind maybe explaining the difference between those? Yeah, for sure. Um, so when you take oestrogen orally, it has to go through the liver. It has to be pro processed through the liver. That's what we call first-pass metabolism. And in that process, um, that... that um, confers a slight increase in risk of unwanted blood clots and strokes. So that is why when your doctor is talking to you about taking oestrogen products like the pill, they'll ask you lots of questions to try and determine if you're someone who might be at increased risk of unwanted blood clots and strokes. Um, so that is one of the sort of cautionary things that we look at um, when we're prescribing. When you use something like a patch or a gel, which is called transdermal oestrogen, that doesn't confer that same increase in risk of unwanted blood clots and strokes. So that's the main difference there. Louise, did you want to add anything? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's a lot easier to change the dose as well when people have it through the skin um, because everyone's different and our skin type's very different actually as well our skin is actually a barrier we don't rub on our moisturizer in the morning and expect it to go into our bloodstream <laughs> hopefully not um but the patches and, and gels are designed so that the molecule of estrogen can go through the skin into the bloodstream and start working straight away go around the bloody to all the cells some people don't absorb the patches very well or absorb the gel very well. So some people come to our clinic, in fact, about a third of people come to our clinic and say, oh, HRT doesn't suit me. And then when you talk to them, they say, oh, no, I rub the gel on and it's floating off my skin and dripping down, you know, and it not being absorbed very well. So those people, we sometimes change to a different type of gel or to patches, or some people find the patches don't stick on well, and then we change to a gel. Or some people need higher doses just to get the same amount in the skin. So you can be more flexible flexible, whereas the tablets are really a one-size-fits-all. Um, and in the perimenopause, often you're still producing hormones, so you might only need a smaller amount, and then the deficit will increase as your own hormones decline, and then you'll need a bit more. So we're constantly changing the doses, and I think that's important to realise that, you know, what I'm on might be different to what someone else is on, and also the dose I'm on today might be different to the dose I'm on in six months or a year's time. It can always take about three months for people to um, really improve. There are those really annoying people that after about three days feel amazing, <laughs> but I certainly wasn't one of those. And it can take a little while, can't it? So patience is really important. Um, but if you are still getting symptoms, it's always worth um, looking at whether the dose needs changing or the type needs changing or adding in testosterone, for example. And some people get side effects. If they're going to get side effects, it's usually to the progesterone and the different types of progesterone. It's very unusual to get side effects to oestrogen. It's usually because the dose isn't right. Uh, the immediate side effects can be things like breast tenderness or some people can get some bleeding or bloating, but that usually settles. And if it doesn't settle, obviously, we always look to see if there's any other reasons or any other investigations that's need doing but patience is a virtue it's worth starting hrt and then switching off all social media for three months i think <laughs> and you mentioned about dose flexibility too that's um brings the point up about why it's sometimes better to be using separate products for your estrogen mm. and your progesterone because um the fixed fixed dose combination products aren't as flexible so you know we might need to um, tweak the doses relative to one another or use the progesterone in a different way and you can't do that if you've got you know a combined patch or a, a tablet that's got the fixed doses in it wonderful and just one other thing i think it's important to touch on there if we can is the combining of estrogen and progesterone together why do we do that 
it's usually, if we, well, those women that still have a womb, when you have oestrogen, it, built, it can build up the lining of the womb. So there's an increased risk of bleeding. And for a very small, it is a small proportion of women, there's an increased risk of changes to the lining of the womb and, and cancer. So in the old days, well, not that old, but in the sort of 40s, 50s, when they gave oestrogen on its own, they found there was a small increased risk. If you give progesterone, it keeps the lining of the womb thin so it doesn't grow, so therefore it's less likely to develop cancer. So people who are on um, oestrogen and progesterone actually have a lower risk of cancer of the womb compared to people that aren't on any. Um, but there are obviously different types and different regimes of taking it. But progesterone is a biologically active hormone. It's very anti-inflammatory. It can be very good for the brain. The micronized progesterone, the body identical progesterone we prescribe, we usually say take it at night because people find they sleep better with it. So there are quite a few women who have had a hysterectomy, so they've had their womb removed in an operation and they don't need the progesterone to protect the lining of the womb because they don't have one, but they actually in, enjoy the benefits of progesterone. Um, and so um, some women actually like progesterone in that way and they can still have it um, because there are benefits for the brain, there can also be benefits for the bone as well. There are some women who are intolerant of progesterone. It's a real, I was saying at lunchtime, Marmite, but I should really say Vegemite because I'm in Australia. You either love progesterone or hate it really, don't you? There are some women who um, find that they, whatever dose type regimen, they just don't tolerate it very well at all. So we do spend quite a lot of time trying to sort of optimise and sometimes minimise progesterone if people are having side effects to it. Yeah, fantastic, thank Can you. Can I just make one more point there? There are some women who've had hysterectomies that we will still um, need to give a progestin mm. to, particularly if they've had very severe endometriosis yeah. or something like that, they might still need it. Mm. Yeah, because um, the endometriotic deposits will also need to be kept um, stable uh, and that's the job of the progestin or progesterone. Fantastic, thank you. So, Louise, if I can ask you to touch on this first, because you did mention this earlier... There are women who are unable to take HRT, MHT. Can you expand on that a little bit for us, please? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting. I see a lot of women and, and actually get a lot of messages on social media to say, I've been told I can't have HRT. Now, um, before going into any reasons why someone might not want to, I think it's very difficult in medicine or life, and having brought up three children, to say you absolutely can't do something. I think, you know, in medicine especially... There we have sort of informed con consent, we have shared decision making. So even if I think something might benefit somebody and they don't want it, it is up to them as long as they know that there are benefits or risks of taking or not taking a treatment. And that's really, really important. It's something we learn quite early on in medicine, actually. And so if I think the risks are too high of HRT, but someone else really wants it, then we have to have a really open, shared decision-making sort of conversation. Well, lots of people are told they can't have it because they've had a clot in the past or a stroke. But as we've already heard, there isn't an increased risk of clot or stroke with the through-the-skin preparations of oestrogen or the natural progesterone. And so those women usually can quite safely take HRT. Some people have been told who have migraines they can't have HRT because with a, a tablet there's an increased risk of stroke. With some types of migraine, people have a small increased risk of stroke. You don't want to increase a small risk can make a slightly higher risk. But again, it's not there with the, through the skin. There are some types of cancers where people say, have been told they absolutely can't have HRT. And we see people who've had maybe a bowel cancer or a skin cancer or um, a, maybe a cancer of their cervix. Well, those women usually can have HRT because there isn't any evidence that those people have a worsening prognosis if they take HRT. So the big sort of unknown really is women who've had breast cancer. And in the past, we've always said, no, you can't if you've had breast cancer. But actually, when you look at the evidence, there are very, very few studies. And there was only one study that actually wasn't a really well set up study, a study called the Habit Study, which showed that there might have been an increased risk. Um, and there was an extra 22 women who had an increased um, risk of, of recurrence, so not death, not metastatic disease, of recurrence of their breast cancer, but they might have had it anyway. But because of those 22 women, everyone now says, well, if you've had a breast cancer, 
you can't take HRT. But some studies, there were other studies, there was a study called the Stockholm study, which showed that there was a reduction risk. Um, but everyone ignores those studies. Um, and there's a lot of talk about estrogen receptors. So if you've had breast cancer, or if a woman's had breast cancer, they say, well, if it's estrogen receptor, it's estrogen driven. Well, I've already said that every cell in our body responds to estrogen. So every cell in our body has an estrogen receptor in it. So most types of cancer, if you test for it, will have estrogen receptors. The ones that are estrogen receptor negative actually are mutated. They're, the cells have changed so much because of the cancer, they've lost their receptors. So an estrogen receptor negative cancer is um, actually a more aggressive type of cancer than an estrogen receptor positive. So estrogen receptor doesn't mean it's caused by estrogen. Some types of uh, breast cancer, they actually say to block estrogen, to stop estrogen, um, to try and improve prognosis. But again, the, the, the studies show that most of the benefit from someone who's had breast cancer is actually surgery. Um, and sometimes we, they give radiotherapy or chemotherapy, depending on the type and the stage of cancer. Having any blocking treatments, hormone blocking treatments, might have a small advantage, and they do with some types, but it's a very small advantage. Um, we see women in the clinic who've had breast cancer 15, 20 years ago, and they've been told they absolutely can never have HRT, yet they've got osteoporosis, they're more worried about their heart disease risk, they can't work because they can't think, they've tried a thousand alternatives and nothing's working, and they say, actually, if I'm going to die, I want to die standing up rather than lying down. I want to try and have, you know, a relationship again with my partner. I want to try and get my job back. And I'm more worried about my osteoporosis or my bones. So again, it, it's sharing that uncertainty with patients. Um, we've just done a huge amount of work with some oncologists and radiotherapists and breast cancer surgeons going through this process called the Delphi process, where you strip apart all the evidence and you go through it all and you, you come out with some consensus statements. So we've got about 26 statements about HRT, about the benefits, because women who've had breast cancer will still have benefits from HRT, but the risks are that it might make their breast cancer come back or there might be problems, but we don't know. So it's sharing that uncertainty um, and allowing women to sort of make a choice as well. And with HRT, it's very reversible. It doesn't build up in the body, which a lot of people think. So if I took my patches off today, it, they'll all be, the estrogen will be out of my body tomorrow. So a lot of women say, well, let me try it and see how I feel, and then I can make that decision. And nothing is right or wrong. I think it's really important. There are some alternatives that can help some symptoms, but they're usually focused on the vasomotor symptoms, the flushes and sweats. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I've seen people who have had 15, 20 flushes a day, you know, women who can't sleep because they're so hot. But it's the, it's the brain, it's the cognition symptoms that often floor people the most. And so a lot of these medications won't improve that and actually can worsen for some people. Um, but then it's all about individualisation. But vaginal hormones, because they go in the vagina, they just seep into the, the vulva, vagina, the surrounding tissues, um, including the bladder and the pelvic floor. They don't go into the bloodstream. So women who've had breast cancer can still usually have vaginal hormones. And that's very important because a lot of women we see who've had breast cancer have really bad vaginal dryness, soreness, or urinary symptoms. And they've been told they can't have any hormone at all. So again, it's very, very individualized. Um, but it's important to just not take no and even if it's no today it might be yes in a few years time or a few months time as well yeah fantastic thanks Louise Kelly let's move on to non-hormonal treatment options because I think it's really important to touch on those for women that um, choose not to go down the HRT or the MHT um, route. So what non-hormonal drug options are available for the management of symptoms? Mm. Um, so the best stuff we've got, um, the best information we have, and you can get some of this from the Australasian Menopause Society's website. They've got a great fact sheet um, about non-hormonal treatments for menopausal symptoms. It mostly refers to the vasomotor symptoms, which is the flushes and sweats. Um, now, although, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, controversy in perimenopause about 
what's the right treatment for mental health symptoms, and a lot of women don't want to be put on, um, rightly so, don't want to be put on antidepressants for a problem that may actually be largely hormonal. Um, in fact, some of the antidepressants are really, really good at helping with hot flushes. So they can be particularly useful for a woman who's got really bad hot flushes and a mood disorder as well. So um, SSRI antidepressants, um, SNRIs, um, so we've, I think the best, the best evidence is certainly in the um, AMS fact sheet is around the um, venlafaxine and escitalopram. Um, then there are other things, gabapentin, which is a, it's actually um, an anti-epileptic medication, but it's also used for a range of other things. It's quite sedating and it, not everyone can tolerate it very well, but it can also be very effective. So again, this is listed in that fact sheet I mentioned. Um, there are other things like clonidine. Um, also, and it's sort of, it's, it's actually been used for, for blood pressure problems. So anyone with already quite low blood pressure won't tolerate that very well, most likely. And both gabapentin and clonidine um, can have particular side effects um, that are going to make them difficult for some women to use. There are also things like oxybutynin. Now, oxybutynin is used quite widely um, for overactive bladder. So it's probably a really good choice for somebody who's got dreadful sweats and flushes and also overactive bladder. So you might find that's helpful. And then, you know, there's a range of other non-medication things uh, that have been shown to be helpful, particularly cognitive behavioural therapy has um, evidence to support it. And there's a great book by a lady named Myra Hunter on that one as well, if you're interested in finding more about that. In fact, she's written a few good books. Yeah, and yeah. that book's specific to menopause, isn't it? it she, I, she's written a few, but yes, there is one that's specific to menopause, yeah, yeah I think. Um, and, uh, of course, there's all the other, you know, we never, ever will have a, a menopause consultation where it's all about the medication, you know. I mean, we need to look at the holistic person. We're looking at um, what their other medical issues are, what's their psychosocial context, what's their environment like. Um, and, you know, if a woman is feeling you know, dreadful because she's not getting any sleep. It's going to make her flushes worse. So sometimes you have to sort the, the sleep problems out to help the flushes. Sometimes you have to sort the flushes out to, to so she can get a good night's sleep. Um, but ultimately, you know, managing symptoms is one thing. And then we've got to look at, OK, we, we manage this lady's symptoms, whether it be with hormones or something else. But well, well beyond menopause or beyond the actual event of menopause when she pops out her last egg, she's got to live the rest of her life, which could be 50 years. She needs to know what are the things that are going to support her health, what does she really need to target to support her health going forward so that she can be happy, healthy, you know, have good quality of life for longer and be functional. So we've got to look at all of that stuff, not just the medical stuff. Yeah, perfect. I'm going to jump into the next question. Jules. <laughs> Welcome to the conversation, Hello. lovely. <laughs> um, I'm going to throw this one to you first. How important are lifestyle factors such as diet, exercise, smoking, sleep, stress management and alcohol when managing symptoms? I'd love to hear your experience around this um, and then I'm going to throw to um, Louise and Kelly to cover off um, a kind of more medical side to that as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've written my top three um, recommendations. Number one is sleep. So I love my bed. Um, and I love to spend time in my bed by myself. My husband's on the front row, so he'll <laughs> testify to that. Um, so, you know, as the, as the lady said, um, you, your sleep can be affected during menopause. I, I'm actually lucky that mine isn't affected. Um, in fact, I probably want to sleep more. Um, so I think managing your sleep, anything you can do to, to, to help with your sleep is really important. Um, you need sleep to process the neurotoxins from your brain and, and, um, and yeah, live a longer, healthier life. So you need it for your brain health. So it's really important. 
Um, my second one is exercise. So anybody that knows me, um, I've got a few nicknames like Jogging Jewels and all kinds of things. So I'm a fierce advocate for exercise. Um, and it really does need to be strength training. So um, I'm, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, Sonia, because Sonia is actually a PT. So, um, But you do need weight-bearing exercise. Um, weight training um, just to, just for your for your bones for your, to help your bone density um, but I think with exercise it's important that you find something that you enjoy um, you know do it with friends anything to get you moving um, and that's great um, and the third thing is really diet um, actually for me it was alcohol so I, ha I had to give up alcohol I just could not tolerate alcohol which is quite ironic given there's a bar over there and everyone's got a drink in their hand so please don't at me um yeah but I, I just couldn't tolerate alcohol anymore I couldn't tolerate the, the anxiety associated with the next day um and the feelings that I had so it was just it was just something that I just had to stop um I still eat chocolate though and I love it um but yeah I think also with diet it's um a high protein diet so we, we really do need to support our um our tissues with with um good quality protein um uh, and I think it's I think correct me if I'm wrong, but women of our age really do need about two grams per um, kilo of body weight to, to sort of support our protein needs. Um, and there's great, there's great app trackers and things for... Oh, they've cut me off. Oh, no, I'm back. Um, yeah, so there's, there's great app trackers out there that you can look at what you're eating. So it's actually quite eye-opening when you actually do look at your diet. Um, what else did I write? There's actually, I think actually one thing that was a kind of revolutional, revolutionising sort of piece of information with me was actually me and Kerry frequently share podcast ideas. So I'll be like, have you listened to this? And she's like, have you listened to this? And something that Kerry actually suggested to me was um, fast like a girl. So I don't, I don't advocate intermittent fasting. But what I learned from reading that book was actually how to eat as a woman and how to eat to your cycle. So... There's actually a reason why we crave chocolate two or three days before our period, and that is because that is when we make progesterone, and progesterone likes a lot of sugar to make, or a lot of glucose, that's correct, isn't it? Is that on my right in saying that, ladies? Yep. <laughs> um, and so you do need, you do, you need, more, you need more sugar, you need more, more um, glucose to make the progesterone. So there's actually things in that book that taught me how to eat, um, and, and what you need to, to sort of fuel, fuel your body and fuel your hormones and, and so your body can actually make the hormones. Um, so there's lots of information out there. Um, yeah, caffeine as well. So obviously caffeine can... Um, I still drink coffee, so it's not all doom and gloom. Um, but yeah, so caffeine can obviously give you hot flushes and, and, and sort of stimulate your sympathetic nervous system. So that is something else that you may sort of want to look at. But, yeah, th those are my kind of tips for... Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Jules. Louise, what would you add around lifestyle factors? Yeah, I totally agree. It's really easy to eat badly. <laughs> um, and, but actually making small changes. But, but I think it's really important to add something to your diet rather than taking it away, which sounds a bit weird. But rather than say you can't have X, Y, Z, think about what you can have. Think about just adding in maybe a handful of nuts or seeds or something that you might not necessarily have thought about before. If we can reduce some of our sugar content, if we can reduce processed foods, all the things that you know taste good, are really addictive, um, that are really quick and easy to eat, are the things that we really shouldn't be. And it's not just um, for symptom control, actually. It's for looking at our metabolic health, looking at our risk of type 2 diabetes and uh, cardiovascular disease. So really, really important. But not just for us as menopausal women. It's for our, our families as well. It's, it's So making changes we should make throughout. I, you know, I don't feel that we should be just doing it because we're menopausal. We should be doing it anyway, really. Um, some people find that they do need to change the type of exercise they do so I see a lot of women who are incredibly fit like a lot fitter than me they're really good runners or they, they do a lot of hits the high intensity work but they find that they're not losing weight the same way or they're not able to build muscle the same way um, or they externally look very fit but their pelvic floor their core is not very good um, it's really, really important that we look at our, at our core, and that's partly because of our pelvic floor is really important. We don't want to be coughing or sneezing and having a little accident, but also for our back, for our posture.
posture for you know this osteoporosis risk and everything else as well a lot of people also find if they do the HIIT exercises, it can release more adrenaline and cortisol. And then it can, again, that can be a change to your metabolism and it enable, means some people can put on weight. So actually changing, I mean, obviously I'm very converted into yoga because I do a lot of yoga, but yoga, Pilates, a different style of exercise can be good. And exercise is not just about getting fit physically, it's about mentally as well. And part of the reasons I do yoga is because when I'm on my mat I become very focused and I don't really think about much else and when you're doing a headstand there's very little else you can think about um, so it's really good for me mentally actually to slow down and even thinking about meditation which is something that a lot of people might think oh I'm too busy I can't do it but actually trying new skills and new types of exercise can be really really beneficial actually yeah awesome Jules, I'm going to um, call on you again. I'd, I'd like you to talk about advocating as a patient for yourself. This is something that you have um, incredible lived experience at. You've been an incredible role model. But not everybody understands what it means to advocate for yourself and what the benefits of doing so are. Can you talk us through um, what that looked like for you and what advice you would give other people to um, who do need to advocate for themselves? Yeah. So I think advocating for yourself, you're, you're the only one that lives in your body. So you have to really trust the way that you feel. Um, you've got to listen to your body. And if something's not right, then you've got to, you've, you've got to sort of educate yourself about, about what, it, what it is. So if I look at my kind of menopause journey, um, it actually started with my sister-in-law who... Um, told me about HRT and I was exactly the same. I was like, oh, doesn't that cause breast cancer? And she's actually a very smart lady sitting on the front row next to my husband um, with a PhD and a dentist. And um, she's like, no, no, the research actually is, is, was, was, um, was very flawed and it actually doesn't show that. So I was like, hmm, I'm just going to park that and remember that. Um, and so when I sort of started on my journey, I, I, I actually started with low iron, um, funnily enough. Um, and... I didn't know. I, I I didn't know that heavy periods were a thing. I didn't know it wasn't normal to have really big clots and all this kind of stuff. And um, and so I had to really learn and educate myself. And I had to find places of reliable sources. And you know, I am a nurse. I do have the ability to look at research, and I do have the ability to sort of know what's a load of rubbish and what's actually quite good common sense. Um, but it is also standing up, you know, I did say to Kerry, look, I, I feel like there's something missing in my treatment. I, I actually want to go and find somebody who can give me what, what I need. Um, and, you know, and this is where we are today. So I think it is, it is about educating yourself. It's about learning, listening to your body. Um, it's about knowing where to get access to information. So, I mean, Louise's website, she's sort of mentioned, uh, sorry, Louise's app, she's mentioned it a couple of times tonight. It is an absolutely phenomenal source of information. Um, and I'm saying that because she's sitting here, but it's actually changed, <laughs> genuinely changed my life. I don't, I, I don't bullshit. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's got so much information on there um, and so many stories for, for people um, who lived experience. Um, she's, also got, so she's also got her podcast as well with, with people that have gone through the same. And so you don't feel like you're alone. You don't feel like you're going, going completely mad. It's quite a lonely journey. Um, you know, so there is, there, there is that, there is that um, sort of support and that um, misery likes company almost. So it, it's really good to hear that other people have been on that journey and they've come out the other side. So, you know, listen to yourself, empower yourself. Um, in Australia, we've got the AMS, the Australian Menopause Society. They've got some great resources. We've got Jean Hales, um, Kelly's, Kelly's um, uh, summit next week. It's open to everybody. Um, you know, really, really empower yourself. Know your body. Know this next stage of your life. You know, we actually weren't meant, we're not designed to live until we're 80. You know, we're supposed to, after, our, after we've had menopause, we're supposed to sort of curl up and die and shrivel up. And we've got another 30 years to live, right? So we want to make it I'm good. sorry, I'm living for another 50. Oh, you're living for 50. I don't think I've got the energy. Um, but yeah, because I'm post-menopause. You're you post-menopause. I'm still going through. I'm, I'm riding the wave that comes after. Yeah, so I'm not. So right now I'm sweating and... Um, plucking my chin hairs as we speak. So anyway, um, I think, yeah, so I've lost my train of thought now. What was I saying? <laughs> exactly. See? 
Um, yeah, so, yeah, just advocate for yourself. Know where to get access to information. Um, so the Australian Menopause website, Jean Hales, um, social media, um, some social media, good sources. Um, yeah, so, you know, just, just, just know your body. Know the symptoms, I think. That's the most, the, the, one of the biggest... Um, one of the biggest recommendations I can make is learn the symptoms, know what they are, because um, pretty much everything can be put down to perimenopause. So, yeah. Yeah, Kelly, did you want to add to that before we move on? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with everything that Jules said there. I think... Um, it's very easy to feel disempowered when you've been going along to doctors and they're just going, oh, you know, this is just a natural part of life. You know, it'll be over in a couple of years. Don't worry about it. Um, and you just you just kind of think, oh, well, they're the doctor. They should know. I guess, you know, I just have to suck it up. Um, you know, just be, be informed. Um, don't, don't just... I mean, yes, Facebook groups are a great, great source of support, but... Um, the, the menopausal transition is a very individual journey and it's not going to look the same for everyone. And what works for one person won't work for another. And, you know, your friend who's had a great experience with a certain type of treatment, it may absolutely not be the right thing for you for a bunch of medical or personal or other reasons. So, uh, you know, you really do need to, to look at a source of getting a very individualised um, approach that takes into account your holistic situation. Um, if you're feeling shut down, then go, you know feel feel your gut on that and move on and, and find someone who's actually listening to you and answering your questions properly. And uh, yeah, do question everything. You know, um, look, ask about the evidence when somebody says, "Oh, you know, you should take this stuff that you know they make up down the back shed down here." Um, you know, ask what, what the evidence is that that helps. Um, you know, and please do sign up for our Menopause Uncensored Summit next week. We'd love to have you along for that. We've got ten expert speakers who, including um, the brilliant Professor Jay Shri Kolkani, who's going to be doing the the mental health conference next week. So, you know, uh, look for people who are subject matter experts and look for the really well validated websites and don't take anything on face value without checking your facts, I would say. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. Now, while we're talking about Jayashri Kulkarni, who is an absolute um, leader in her field when it comes to women's mental health, for anybody that's not familiar with her, um, Louise, I want to ask you one final question before we move on to our next bank of questions. Um, and then, Kelly, I'll, I'll cross to you for your input on this as well. If a woman experiences a reproductive depression, so she might have postnatal depression or PMDD, what impact may that have in their perimenopausal and menopausal years? Usually quite bad. <laughs> so it, it really varies, and this is partly because studies haven't been done that well, but probably about 15% of women will have... PMS, about 5%, they say PMDD, but I think it's a lot more, actually. Um, a lot of people will have postnatal depression. It's actually one of the commonest causes of mortality, actually, in young women is postnatal depression. Um, and a lot of these women are really sensitive to their... Uh, to hormonal changes, their brains are very sensitive. So our brains like homeostasis, they like everything the same. So those of you, like my husband, who become very hangry, you know, you're hungry and you're angry at the same time, your brain doesn't like it, or not many of you, but maybe some of you have had hangovers, you know, your brains don't like it. So, um, so, and it's the same with hormones. Our hormones are actually neurotransmitters. They're hormones, as I've already said, but they, they work as chemicals in our brain. So they work with other neurotransmitters, they fire up circuits in our brains, they help the sugar metabolism in our brain, they're very anti-inflammatory in our brain. So when we don't have hormones, some people find that it affects the serotonin, the happy hormone, it affects their dopamine, their um, reward sort of hormone, it affects their noradrenaline and adrenaline, it can affect their... Um, their cortisol, their stress hormones, it can affect acetylcholine and other neurotransmitters. And some people don't notice it at all, but others really do. Um, so we do see a lot of people who become very low in their mood during the perimenopause, and it's usually worse in the perimenopause than the menopause. 
So the fluctuations in hormones can really trigger chaos in the brains. Um, and some women might just feel a bit low and a bit flat and a bit joyless, but other people do have very negative, very intrusive thoughts. And sadly, but it's real, the risk of suicide in women is about seven times greater in the late 40s. And of course, there can be other changes and reasons why people have these thoughts, but a lot of it is related to hormones. And a lot of these women will have had postnatal depression or PMDD. Um, and what's really sad is there's such little research in this area. But the research we do have does show that hormones are beneficial and hormones, if they're given, can actually reduce the incidence of clinical depression. They can um, actually treat low mood that's related to hormonal changes. And even people who still need antidepressants for their, their clinical depression, antidepressants can work better in the presence of estrogen as well. But the other hormone that can be very beneficial is testosterone. And we've mentioned testosterone. And currently, the guidelines say we can give it if people have reduced libido. Um, most people at some stage of their life will have reduced libido. Um, but we find in our clinical practice, and lots of others do, that mood, energy, concentration, stamina can improve. And we've recently just looked at over 900 of our patients who've added in testosterone to their HRT. And we found, unsurprisingly, their libido improves, but their mood, um, their low mood, their anxiety um, has improved more significantly, actually, than libido. And a lot of women we see have come from psychiatric clinics. They've on, been on lots of heavy-duty drugs, not just antidepressants, but antipsychotics as well. And we, we find with our clinical experience that adding in testosterone to HRT can really make a difference to mental health. Um, not for everyone. I'm not saying that hormones are going to cure all mental health, but they certainly can. And people who have been diagnosed with bipolar or schizophrenia, often having the right hormones can really make a difference. So we shouldn't undervalue the importance of hormones. And what's really frustrating, and I've been speaking to Prof. Carl Carney for many years, because she's one of the few psychiatrists in the world that prescribes HRT. Like, it's madness. Psychiatrists can prescribe all sorts of medication without any biochemical test. We just go on a story for a lot of psychiatric medication, but they don't prescribe HRT. And the gynecologists often do not think there's a mental health component of the menopause because if someone's got florid mental health symptoms, they'll see a GP or a psychiatrist. They won't see a gynecologist. So for many years, and even now, there's still this real... It's, it's really hard. And about seven years ago, when I first read about um, Prof. Karkani's work, I phoned her up and said you know, you're incredible. She said, no, I'm not. I've had enough. I'm done with it all because no one's listening. And I was like, don't give up. It's really important. Thank goodness she didn't. And it's, but it, it's so, but it is hard when you've got different groups of healthcare professionals um, and the poor women stuck in the middle. Um, so doing joined up uh, uh, care, and I don't want to big ourselves up as GPs, but I think we're, we're in a really good place because we can look at everything together. And of course, no one's mental health illness is usually going to be 100% better with one treatment. It can be a combination of drug and non-drug treatments, um, but it's really important that we look at every single um, sort of aspect, which often doesn't happen, sadly. Yeah. Kelly, anything to add with that? No, it was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> Thanks, Louise. All right, we're going to change gears slightly. As I um, prefaced at the start, we are moving into answering some questions that were sent through from you guys, basically. Everybody that is in the audience got the opportunity to send through some questions um, that they were hoping to get answered on the night. So um, this is where we are going to move into answering those. Louise, the first one is for you. And look, some of these you might find that we've, you know, through the answering of these, we've kind of answered them anyway. But why do some women not tolerate estrogen even at very low doses? And what options are available to them? And do even small doses have some long term benefits? Okay, there's not many people actually that don't tolerate estrogen. Some people we find, certainly in the perimenopause, might find that they don't tolerate estrogen as well. Um, and that's partly because they've got estrogen in their body already. Um, so you're giving something and they might have higher levels because in the perimenopause you can swing up and down. Um, and they might have a lot of symptoms that you think might be related to the perimenopause and estrogen deficiency, but they might be more related to testosterone deficiency actually. So increasingly in the, in the clinic, 
clinic, if we see somebody who finds that they get more sort of breast tenderness or it doesn't, estrogen doesn't suit them, then we might start testosterone and then add in estrogen slowly as their own estrogen declines. Sometimes it can be the type of estrogen, though. They might say, oh, it really doesn't suit. And then you might do a blood level and find that they're really not absorbing much at all. Um, and so it's not until you increase the dose they start to feel better. People might find they don't tolerate tablet estrogen because, as Kelly's already said, you metabolise anything that goes in your um, mouth, anything that goes in your mouth, including alcohol, um, will get metabolised by the liver. So estrogen gets metabolised into different types of estrogen as well. It, the pure estrogen, the good estrogen, if you like, is this estradiol, it's called. And when we give it through the skin, it stays as estradiol. When we take it orally, it gets converted into other types of estrogen. And some of those can be more pro-inflammatory or cause side effects. So you just have to be careful what it is that you take. Um, and But even low doses, so there's been a whole narrative that you have to have um, HRT or start it before the age of 60 or within 10 years of your menopause because that's what the WHI study said the benefits were with the older types of HRT. Um, but we see women in the clinic in their 60s, 70s, 80s. We've even seen someone for their 90th birthday present bought themselves <laughs> a consultation because she wanted to feel better. Um, and actually, because we're very fortunate with the um, transdermal preparations, they're a lot safer, as we know. They don't have a clot or stroke risk. But we can start with very low doses. So often women who are older, we start with a low dose and see how they feel. But some studies have shown even low doses are good for bone protection so they can help strengthen bone. And also HRT is licensed as a treatment for osteoporosis. Most osteoporosis specialists will not prescribe HRT. They'll prescribe the more expensive um, drugs that have more side effects, actually. So low doses can still be good. We don't always have to be giving higher doses. Amazing. Now, the next question is also for you, and it's kind of related to what you were just talking about. What is a safe blood level of testosterone? Oh, now this is a million-dollar question it because... <laughs> We, you don't, we don't know to, is, an, is a very simplistic answer because I can't think and I can't find a study where they've looked at blood levels of thousands of women who are menstruating. So we don't know what is normal and we don't know what's normal for each person. So all we do is guess. So there's lots of graphs that we all learn in, in school and in medical school looking at the way that oestrogen peaks throughout the cycle and then re reduces. And so we know roughly women's physiological, so sort of normal estradiol levels is between 250 and 1,000 picomoles per, per, per um, litre. But it, it does vary throughout the cycle. And so when we measure estradiol levels, they can be a guide. But lots of things in medicine, we do a test, but the patient in front of us is more important than a blood test. So that's really important to know. If you have a blood test, though, so when I started my HRT and wanted to feel better overnight, like um, everyone else does, and I wasn't, when I went back to my consultant after three months, my level was very low. It was only 110, and I was on the so-called so maximum licensed dose. And he said, well, just double the dose because you're not patches aren't sticking very well. Um, and I did that, and then my level came up to 300 um, also, and I started to feel a lot better. And my patches crinkle, they don't stick very well, so, so that's fine. And some people feel even better when their level's more like 600 as opposed to 200. Some people feel fantastic when their level's 250. So it all varies. But we also see sometimes, we see people in the clinic and they do a blood test, and it comes back as 2,000 or 3,000, and you think, oh my goodness. But then they're perimenopausal, they're producing their own estrogen as well. You do it again a week later, and it will be down at 30 or yeah. something. So we've got to take the numbers with a pinch of salt. And the other thing to warn, I don't know if it's a thing over in Australia, but it is in the UK. There's lots of companies that do these finger prick testing, and it looks so easy on their website because you just have a a drop of blood and it pops into a tube. If any of you have tried, it's a right mess and it's really painful and trying to get this drop of blood that's smeared on your finger into a tube. But actually what happens is that the blood gets hemolyzed so the estrogen levels can be sometimes 10 or 100 times higher than they would be on a venous sample. So if you are trying to self-manage or help your doctor by doing a blood test, don't do one of the finger prick ones because they can be wildly wrong. Good advice. Um, and just in relation to that testosterone question, what can a woman do if they suffer hair loss 
or increased facial hair while they're taking testosterone? Yeah, very interesting question. So with testosterone, it's a very low dose that we give. So we don't um, want people to have side effects in anything we give in medicine, of course. So when we give testosterone, the dose is very, very low. And we're giving a low dose to someone who's got a low level of testosterone in their body. And then we measure blood tests usually. And they can be more accurate than the... Um, estradiol levels and certainly in our clinic the majority of our women are on the lowest 50 percent for their testosterone blood results even though they're on testosterone and most women underuse testosterone because we've all read about these side effects of growing beards and low voice and you know clitoromegaly and all sorts of things but actually in the clinic the only side effects i've seen is when people have gone to these compounded bioidentical clinics where they don't really know what they're getting or they've pretended that their husband and they've ordered it online so they could get some testosterone and then they have no idea how they use it. So they're often using really high doses. Um, occasionally people will come and say, oh, my hair's thinner or um, I've got problems. But then you realise that they're iron deficient or they've got another reason for their hair loss. And there's lots of reasons, lots of reasons, especially in the sort of 40s or 50s where people can get hair thinning. There haven't been good studies because no one's done them. But lots of people find that women who take testosterone, actually, they find that their hair can grow better, actually. Um, there's very few people that say that their hair actually falls out. And the other thing, just to bear in mind, if you have any hair changes, it can take three months for changes. So people that say, I started testosterone last week and my hair's thinning, it will be something that happened three months ago, not that happened three days or a week before. So we've just got to be mindful hair on the chin um, is um, often due to um, can be an aging thing I'm sorry to say that we're all getting older regardless of what we do with our hormones but sometimes it can be the balance so sometimes if people have got more testosterone in comparison to their level of estrogen um, so sometimes increasing estrogen can sort of reset that but there's all sorts of things we will get sort of weird and wonderful conditions or even common conditions that won't be related to our hormones as well and it, it's really easy we've all done it if you're on something it's easier to blame um, the hormones and even the whole cancer thing we have to remember that one in seven women will get breast cancer whether they take HRT or not. So people who do get uh, breast cancer and taking HRT it w won't be usually because of their HRT. And yeah. that's something that's really important to remember. Yeah, perfect. <coughs> Kelly, um, I can't tolerate progesterone. What is the next best option? Okay, so... Um, when women have a uterus, as mentioned earlier, and they're going to be using estrogen therapy, they also need something called a progestogen to um, keep the lining of the uterus nice and thin and stable because estrogen stimulates the lining of the uterus and it will thicken it up. And if it goes unchecked, it can even be a precursor to endometrial cancer. So super important that if you have a uterus and you're on estrogen, you're on some kind of progestogen. Now, the body identical one is progesterone the micronized progesterone we talked about earlier. Um, now, some women uh, find that their mood really declines badly if they're on, um, you know, progested, progestins, which is synthetic forms. Um, sometimes even they don't tolerate progesterone very well. Um, we do a lot of things in medicine which are considered off-label. Now, I mentioned the therapeutic goods indications for medications earlier, um, and some doctors will prescribe very strictly in line with that, but the reality is that in the perimenopause space, there's actually no, um, no TGA-approved medications, MHT, for perimenopause. They're all indicated for menopausal women. So we, we, it doesn't mean we don't treat them. It just means that what we're doing is off-label. So we do do a lot of off-label things, which means we're using the medications in ways other than what they're strictly approved. Did you take a um, look at gender equ uh, um, equity in the workplace? Are they wanting to reduce the gender pay gap? So the gender pay gap in Australia is something like 22.8% percent or something so it's very very high and next year um, businesses are, are by legislation going to have to publish their gender pay gap so you know businesses that are paying men a lot more than women aren't going to be very attractive to women um, and also women on average retire um, seven and a half years before men so and often at the peak of their careers so 
You're losing so much value and knowledge and experience and passion because women are retiring early. And it's often around the, eight, the, the, the time of menopause, which in Australia is the average age is 51. So you're, you're just, it's, it's such a shame that we're not sort of addressing it. So I think you really do have to sort of just begin with a conversation. You can get in touch with us and we'll, we'll, we'll help you. Um, but yeah, it is, it's talking, it's finding the champions within your workplace. It's making people aware of, of, of the, 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 the things that women are going through. Um, creating support groups within your organisation, finding the champions, finding the voices in there, um, engaging the senior management and, and you know, sort of making, making the business case for it. Um, there's also the legal case, actually. So there is some um, workplace legislation that's come into effect in 2022 um, that organisations have a duty of care to, to reduce psychosocial hazards. Um, in the workplace, and as um, the ladies have ab uh, spoken about tonight, that many women um, do experience stress, anxiety, menopausal depression, um, that really have similar, that, that, uh, similar to um, stress and, and um, psychological stress in the workplace. So um, organisations are starting to contact us and say, look, I really do need to look at uh, menopause as a psychosocial hazard and a potential risk to my organisation. So um, I know there was recently a case in the UK that came to court where somebody did take their workplace to court, um, and I'm sure there's many, many more that are, are, don't actually make it to the court. So, um, you know, we do sort of have a duty of care to, to take care of women. Um, is that sort of kind of what you're after? Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. amazing. Thank yeah. you. Um, okay, we're going to wrap up with two last questions. Um, both interrelated. Kelly, I'm going to go to you first. This question gave me a good giggle when it came through. Are drug companies pushing the anti-MHT agenda as women on MHT are likely to need less other drugs? Uh, I don't think the drug companies that make MHT are pushing that agenda. <laughs> um, I can't speak to any conspiracy theories for, uh, involving drug companies here. Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't, I don't know of anything like that. Um, I think one of the biggest issues we've had here in recent years, as a lot of you in the audience will probably know, is um, issues getting hold of our patches yeah. more than anything We're going to go to that next. Yeah, That's our right. next question. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so. Before we move on to that, yeah. Louise, do you, do you have any thoughts on the anti-MHT <laughs> movement from other pharmaceutical companies? I don't know. I think there's a big conspiracy theory against women, actually, and, and hormones. And it's not just drug companies. I think there's a lot out there. I've been, I don't know if any of you have read the book Unwell Women by Eleanor Clickhorn. I, I hopefully is available over here. But it, it, it just talks about the history of women, actually. And if you think of the word hysteria, and hysteria is the Greek word for womb, and just the way that our womb has controlled our bodies, and people were very scared of this. They were scared about periods. They were scared about changes in women. And even when they understood the menopause was affecting people's um, moods, they used to actually do bloodletting on women. So often they used to um, cut us under our breasts, especially, but also on our legs. And they thought if they drained us of blood, that would help because the periods obviously um, or the lack of periods was affecting people's madness. So we think of the word hysteria. Women haven't been believed for many, many years. And there's a lot of medical gaslighting that goes on. And there's a lot of misdiagnosing. And not all of it's intentional. It took a long time for a gynaecologist to become female. And there was a lot of opposition, actually, against male gynaecologists. Um, so there's a lots of sort of controlling behaviour, which I hate to say is still there in medicine now. Um, and there is a bit of a patriarchy, there certainly is in the UK, and I think there probably is over here, where people are just a bit 
scared of what's going on and they can't they won't really be able to write it down or talk about it but it, it's certainly there um and i think it's also really hard to change people so us sitting here today to say hrt is safe some of you probably in the audience be thinking yeah but who's she she's just come over from uk and she runs a private clinic she's bound to say that but actually you know it's really difficult to unpick something that's happened um but the America, especially in America, pharma is really important. You know, pharma is really important for um, the way doctors work as well, and, and certainly just for transparency. None of myself or none of the doctors who work in Newson Health Group do any paid work with pharma at all. Um, but, you know, there's this talk about we're medicalizing the menopause. Well, actually, it's been medicalized with. Um, uh, painkillers with sleeping tablets with antidepressants with blood pressure lowering drugs with statins so I don't know that drug companies are clever enough almost to think about it but but there are people out there but there's also um, the, in the U. SA, they've got a task, a, a sort of disease prevention task force, and they've recently supposedly reviewed the evidence and says there's not enough evidence for reduction risk of diseases, including heart disease and osteoporosis, to recommend osteo to recommend sorry HRT. In the small print, it says to, for asymptomatic women, as in women without symptoms. So that's like the minority of women. But actually, if they say there is enough evidence, which there is, by the way then it means that they would have to be covered by insurance and in ins they don't want to insure 51% of the population. So the, probably the insurance companies are more to blame than pharma. The other thing to bear in mind is that there is a drug that some of you might have started to read about, which is going to, um, it's coming out, it's out in America, and they're trying to push it through in the UK, which is a neurokinin 7 antagonist, which is a, some receptor in our brain, which will is only good for vasomotor symptoms. So they now talk about VMS in America. Now, the company, Astellas, has spent $2 billion developing this drug. So they've got to get this money back. Um, and so when you look at the studies, actually, it's not much difference to placebo. Um, it, we don't really know how it works in our brain, and it does seem to lower serotonin, the happy hormone, which um, we all could do with a bit more of. So we don't want something that's necessarily going to suppress that. They've also said we need to monitor liver tests quite closely, so it suggests it might affect liver function. We don't know the long-term effects of it, and it costs in the UK about £400 a month. Most menopause specialists and most menopause societies, I know, are already being funded by this drug company. So that's a bit, you know, so when we go to menopause conferences, a lot of the gynaecologists will still talk about vasomotor symptoms all the time. And so, and then there's a bit more narratives on some people's social media talking about all the women who can't have HRT and these poor women who've had breast cancer, and now there's this new drug coming. And I, I worry about that, actually, because, you know, there's one thing not having HRT, and that's fine, I respect that, but there's another thing having a drug that we don't know the long-term effects or, or side effects yeah, of. Yeah, and as one of those women that has a breast cancer history and um, has been denied a number of times um, MHT, um, that drug is very much being targeted um, to breast cancer survivors, particularly that's what's come across my radar here in Australia. Right, it's interesting. So, yeah, so you just have to be careful. <laughs> Great, thank you. And let's finish on supply issues. <laughs> well, I'd like to hear what's been going on in the UK because yeah. like, I know, like, sometimes it seems like this wave that, you know, there's a shortage in the UK and I'm going, oh, no, it's going to hit us yeah. any minute, you know. Um, is, did, was that your experience recently too? Yeah, it's really interesting because if you think... I've, we've already said that the guidance, the evidence is clear, so the majority of menopausal women will benefit from HRT. And before this WHDI study came out, um, the results came out, about 30% of menopausal women were taking HRT. And then overnight, HRT prescribing plummeted, it dropped. Um, up until a couple of years ago, it was about 10% of menopausal women who take HRT. In the UK, it's increased to a magnificent 14%. And we've got these HRT shortages. So when I've been talking to the government and NHS England and saying there is this increased demand, it will continue and it will be exponential, they keep talking about a sort of 
peak and this, you know, that sort of COVID wave thing. So they keep saying, yeah, but then it's, it's like, no, 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 you don't understand. When women start HRT, they usually continue it. And it's 51% of the population. And the drug companies are like, oh, and I, I don't know why. Like, if I owned a drug company that made HRT, like, we'd all be on it, wouldn't we? We'd all be just... So, um, so yeah, and we'd be very wealthy. So it, it's really difficult. They don't seem to understand, but then... There's also what they do in the UK, and I don't know what it's like over here, is the figures that they look at, they look at NHS, the government, our, our UK government, look at what's been prescribed in the NHS, and they look at advisors. And so the last government meeting I went to, somebody said 80% of menopausal women don't want HRT. So I did ask for the evidence for that statement, because it's not what I see. Um, but if the, if the ministers for all the, all the countries in the UK are being told that, they won't see it as a priority. So it, it's, it's really difficult. And they also, it's all very short term, because if you want 14 million women to take something, although it's cheap, it's still quite a lot of money in the short term, isn't it? So there is a bit of a conspiracy theory going on. The drug companies, like... Bezins, who make the estrogel and the micronized progesterone, a very small company. Um, and rather than rubbing their hands with glee, they're just like, oh, no. And then it's a lot cheaper and better for them to sell in Europe than it is because of lovely Brexit. Um, so it's an absolute nightmare for women. And, you know, people just laugh when they talk about these irate women coming into the pharmacists. Um, but actually, it's a real problem. And, and two or three weekends ago now, I visited one of our patients in a psychiatric hospital who'd um, had a shortage of estrogen gel. She tried an alternative, and it didn't work. So her husband was washing up and heard a thud, and she jumped out of the first floor window and broke her back. Um, and it's sectioned. And it's, you know, it's really horrible. You're really messing with people with this. And, you know, you see it over here. And I, I don't know why. I haven't really heard about a shortage of Viagra. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> we would all hear about a shortage of Viagra. Yeah. And there's not a lot of information about why either. Like, you know, um, people sort of murmur a little bit about supply chain of mm. ingredients or this or that, but no one's actually been very clear as to the reason why. No. Um, I mean, one of the companies, Theramex, who make Everol patches, which we can get, which aren't mm. over here. I spoke to the CEO a couple of weeks ago, and I said, just to let you know, I'm going to Australia soon, and there might be a bit of a demand for HRT. And, and he said, oh, we're just prioritizing on, prioritizing on Europe. And we recently, Rebecca and I went to Iceland, and there's now a shortage over there. Um, so they're looking at other countries. But I don't know, I don't know why there's this resistance. They're almost scared that there's going to be another WHI study. And Firstly, there won't be, because it was a billion dollars that was spent on that study, and no one is going to spend a billion dollars on women, I hate to tell you, but it's not going to happen. And secondly, you know, we've got so much evidence. It's not like i am just come here and said, oh, I've read this paper last night, and it looked really good. You know, this is established biological evidence that's there. So HRT is really to stay, isn't it? And so I, I really don't know. I think what is going to just change is that we're just going to keep going and they're going to keep realising and then they'll have to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sadly, we weren't able to um, resolve that. <laughs> we need more female in panel, CEOs in the drug companies, clearly. We do. <laughs> and uh, I think we need a manufacturing plant in Australia. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you so much. That is um, that concludes the questions and the answers and the non-answers and the um, and all the amazing information that everybody has been able to share this evening. Thank you so much, ladies. <laughs> you guys must be so ready to get up and move. On behalf of Louise, Kelly, Jules and Kerry, we hope that the information shared tonight has been helpful and insightful. We've talked a lot this evening about managing symptoms and navigating the transitional years with support and guidance. However, I want to leave you all on a note of positivity and hopefully a little bit of inspiration. So menopause marks the end of our reproductive years. But I believe, and it has absolutely been my lived experience, that this transition awakens within us a time of liberation and self-discovery. 
lean into discovering what you would like your next chapter to read like. There's a powerful postmenopausal life waiting for you. And I strongly suggest that you accept the challenge to do something extraordinary. Louise is going to be signing books. You can buy her latest book down the back here with Jules and the Bucatino crew. And then she is going to be sitting over here at these lovely lounges doing some book signings for you. Now, the signing with Louise is going to be very much a very quick sign and a, and a greet. <laughs> but we do have the very lovely Rebecca who has travelled over with Louise and Rebecca is going to place herself here on the stage. So if you did want to have a little bit more of an extended chat, then Rebecca is going to be your chatter so that we can make sure that we get through the book signings for Louise. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Please drive home safely this evening and thank you for joining us.